This summer I cycled, paddleboarded and hiked all the way from the bottom to the very top of Scotland and I called it the Scottish Adventure Triathlon. I hiked the Cape Wrath Trail, a 370 kilometer long distance walk from Fort William to the most northwesterly point of mainland Britain, Cape Wrath. It's boggy, it's midge infested, but it's absolutely incredible. And because I survived it, I thought I'd tell you how. We don't have midges in Wales, what the hell's going on? <laughs> you don't need to come and be in the video just because I'm talking about Scotland. Hello, Shamai. Grab yourselves a coffee or an alternative beverage of your choice. Also, drinking it from a saucepan is optional. In this video, I'm going to tell you about how I survived the Cape Wrath Trail. And I don't think survived is too much of a strong word. Ah! Ah! So this is going to be more than just a kit video. I'm going to answer some of the big questions that people usually have before doing the Cape Wrath Trail, such as how did you do food? Did you resupply? Did you send yourself food? How did you charge all your electrical items? What did you pack? How did you find the navigation? Where did you poo? Is that one? <laughs> Maybe not. I'll be honest, this probably is going to get a little bit personal, so if you're not comfortable with talking about poo and pants, then... So I asked for questions on Instagram as well. And the number one question that I got asked was how much did your kit weigh? So I took a 65 litre pack and spoiler alert, I am not a lightweight packer. <laughs> so I didn't weigh the thing before I went. I packed last minute and I did not need to put that on a scale to tell me that it weighed a ton. But the other thing is my pack weighs a very healthy 70 tons <laughs> but I have now weighed it because so many people asked and I don't know if I'm mortified at how bad I am at lightweight packing or like more impressed that I actually carried it 370 kilometers what I'm gonna do is tell you the things in this video that I wouldn't take if I did it again and the things that you wouldn't need to take if you weren't filming this for YouTube because I could probably ditch about a kilo and a half in battery packs I'm not gonna lie so without further ado, the base weight of my pack, not including food and water, but everything else that's in there, including the pack itself, stop beating around the bush, Sarah, and tell the damn people how much you carried. 15.3 kilograms. 15.3, 50, 50, 15.3 kilograms base weight. That is shocking. So just for context, if 15.3 kilograms doesn't mean to you that you've basically carried an elephant on your back for the Cape Wrath Trail, most people would aim for under 10, I would say, as a base weight for something like this. Some super, super ultra light packing people would probably be able to get it under five kilograms. But honestly, they must be walking in a thong. Like, I don't know how they do that. I haven't got time in my life to be cutting toothbrushes in half and like freezing my tits off at night in no tent. It kind of comes down to your choice, but 15.3 is a little excessive but like i said i'll tell you what i wouldn't take again and i survived so it can't be that bad so this was my little seaty foamy thing it was literally like um a few quid from go outdoors i think it was I never usually take this type of thing, but actually it was really useful. Um, I stayed in this like deer stalker's hut the one night and there was water like pissing through it. And this was handy just to put on the floor so I could like stand on it when I was trying to get like in and out of my sleeping bag. Um, because that was a mission and a half because it was like a tiny little thin bench thing which I had to fall off. Anyway, useful and would take again. Um, so in the bottom, uh, everyone packs differently. I've always packed similar things in the bottom of my pack. I always have my sleeping bag in the bottom. I actually really fucked up. <laughs> I forgot to put this in a dry bag, which is just insanely stupid. Like I always put this in a dry bag, even just on like a one night wild camp, I put this in a dry bag, unless it's, you know, like definitely not gonna rain. Um, yeah, put your sleeping bag in a flipping dry bag, especially if it's at the bottom, because you put that down in the rain and it gets wet. Anyway, I managed to like after, like a few days to get a carrier bag but um it did get wet a couple of times which is just annoying i don't know why i'm getting it out anyway it's <laughs> it's the rab ascent 500 it is a down sleeping bag which you don't want to get wet <laughs> um 
Yeah, I've had it for years. I, I can't remember what the, the rating is on it, but um, it probably is one of the like slightly warmer. I think most people would probably take like a 400, considering I did it in August. But I only have one sleeping bag, so that's what I took. Um, then I have the Firmarest Neo Air. It's the yellow mustardy coloured one. I um, haven't had this that long actually and I've been through a lot of camping mats because they really piss me off. Like they're actually quite hard to buy. This thing isn't cheap but I'm actually really glad I brought this now, bought it now because it is the best one I've had so far. So yeah, obviously I would take that again. Uh, little pillow. Never used to take these either. Why do I keep trying to get these things out? You don't need to see it. Um, I don't know, do you want to see it? <laughs> you can see it if you want. Um, actually, I can't remember what it's called, so we need to get out so I can actually read the thing. Uh, made in China. Uh, that's all the label says. Oh, Trichology, Trichology. I never normally have these. I normally just use like a bag of clothes, but actually, this is really good. Um, so it's really small, you just blow it up. Would, would take again. Um, oh. Silk sleeping bag liner is the Rab one, the Silk Mummy. Uh, didn't use it. <laughs> I mean, it was August. I think I was like over egging it taking this, but I usually always take this when I'm wild camping, but then most of the time I'm wild camping like up high where it's a bit colder, whereas on the trail there was a lot of like camping in glens and quite low down. So I never needed it because I was never cold. Actually, tell a lie. I used it when the sleeping bag got wet. I didn't get right into the bottom of the sleeping bag. I left like the bottom bit like empty <laughs> because that bit was wet. So I had it like just up to like there and then I had this on my top bit, but I could have just worn my down jacket. Would I take this again? If it wasn't August, probably would. Flies are getting me. Um, but like if I was doing it in August again, nah. I was warm in the night, I didn't need it. And whilst we're on the subject of sleep and recovery, I'm really comfortable now in here. Can I just do the rest of the video from my sleeping bag? I really did try to prioritise my sleep on this trail. I was very aware that if I was going to end up hiking my arse off until the end of the day and then getting up super early and hiking my arse off again the next day, I was just going to be borrowing time from the days ahead of me all the time. So I tried to give myself a cut off every day, depending on where I was, or if I was going to be hiking late into the evening, I would then give myself slightly extra in the morning. Like not a lie-in, we're not talking a Sunday lie-in, like, you know, but just like an extra hour or half an hour just to give myself a little bit more recovery and I think it made a massive difference. I am terrible for like really pushing myself and kicking my own ass into the ground on stuff like this. So in my head I imagined like a graph, this is highly scientific now right, this is like your energy and recovery levels and after day one it's dipped to there but then it's come back up to there. Then after day two it's dipped to there and it's come up not as high as day one but still pretty high. Day three, it's dipped a bit lower, but it's still coming up pretty high. And over the course of the trail, yeah, the general pattern is that you are getting more fatigued, but you're always still gonna have enough to keep going. Now, conversely, if you kick your own ass, on day one, it drops down to here and your recovery only comes up to there because you're hanging out your hoop. On day two, it comes all the way down to here and then it only comes back up to there because right now you're dying. On day three, you've hit the floor and you're almost dead. The next morning, you need CPR to start hiking. Do you know what I mean? You just can't do that. It seems really obvious, but it's very easy to get carried away and just be like, oh, I just won't eat right now, or oh, I won't have a drink, or oh, I won't stop and sort my feet out because they're hurting. You know, you just, you've got to. As soon as you think something like that, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, my foot hurts, you've got to do something about it. And that is probably the best piece of advice that I can give you. Uh, smidge absolutely bloody vital <laughs> let me tell you don't get avon skin so soft they changed the formula it does not now repel the midgy pidgeys if you go in august it's the worst time for midges you'll see when i edit my videos they were an absolute freaking nightmare they let they definitely add like a huge layer a huge like winged flying layer, like literally. You know on cartoons, when like you see like a black cloud of flies or bees or whatever come over on the cartoon? I'm not joking, it was like that. <laughs> 
I, I am not exaggerating and you'll see that in my videos. So smidge, absolutely vital. Doesn't always work, but I think it does help. Um, and in the beginning, I wasn't just putting it on every day, but I suddenly realized like you have to. <laughs> so just just put it on preventatively every morning because um, I think it helps with ticks and stuff as well. Definitely get that. Would take again. Uh, gaffer tape, duct tape, whatever you want to call it. Did I use this? don't know probably would take again always take anyway because it's handy um gas i had this size on my um stove at the start and i used this in about 10 days i think maybe slightly for nine or ten days this was empty um so i had another gas and i actually had one of the bigger ones which is like probably twice the size of this which is on my stove now and i didn't use all of that like i didn't even I probably use half of it, maybe not even half of it. Um, and I helped someone else out who I met on the trail who had run out of gas. And I helped him out a couple of times because we crossed paths a couple of times. So um, if I was doing it again, probably just two of these size ones, not the bigger one, because I came back with loads of gas. Um, and you'll, I'll tell you about how much I was cooking as well, so that for context, that makes kind of sense. Um, powder talcum powder 100 percent would take again i'm gonna park it there because i'm gonna tell you about my foot routine but i'll wait till i get to the other foot stuff that's getting confused with the way. um this is a guilty one baby wipes <laughs> i do hate them because it's so wasteful like they are disposable i only buy the um biodegradable plastic free ones but they still come in a plastic packet. They're still something that you're throwing away. I don't use them for like normal world camps, like, you know, just little couple of days or whatever. But for the Cape Wrath Trail, you just need a clean ass, man. Like I'm not, <laughs> I ain't gonna dress this up. You wanna wipe your butt. Poles, trekking poles. Absolutely loved them. Never used trekking poles before, but actually that's a lie. I've used one once. I hiked the GR20 trail in Corsica years ago um, with the University Arthur Training Corps. A number of us ended up coming down with DNV <laughs> like halfway through. Um, I definitely left my dignity on that trail, I'm not gonna lie. Like when you've had squirty shits behind trees at every opportunity in the mountains, you just lose all dignity. Was that too much information? I don't care. Um, so, so these are the Alp Kit um, blah, 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 Carbon Marathon something or other. I think they're Marathon. Hang on, let me just stop trying to make it up and actually read it. <laughs> ha! It does say on here somewhere. Oh wait, I need to construct it because it says it up there. Okay, Alp Kit Car Carbon Marathon. So they fold up as you've just seen. Um, they're really easy to put together. Amazing like absolutely would never do a long distance trail where you're carrying loads of weight without poles ever again so good um and these ones alp kit if you're not familiar with the brand these were gifted to me so thank you very much alp kit um but they're not like massively overpriced in fact they're really reasonable and these are the marathon racer ones so they're mainly for like ultra runners and stuff so i was a little bit worried are they going to be strong enough but i wanted something super light which is why i went for these and do not regret them for a second these are so strong like i'm not gonna lie i put these things through the absolute mill i was using them as like crutches pretty much like i felt like i had four legs at times <laughs> um I catapulted myself across bogs with them. I was like sticking them in rocks, getting them stuck, yanking them out. Like I was not careful. Like I've scratched them a lot, but they were so strong, so good. Absolutely love them. Definitely recommend them. Definitely would take again. Water. So I took a Camelback. That is a two litre Camelback and my Waterwell bottle. And then for filtration, so water is not a problem on the, well, I say water is not a problem. Water wasn't a problem for me on the Cape Wrath Trail. The only time I started to like mildly think about water a little bit more was towards the end because it did dry off, but it was still fine. However, I would say if it was like dry weather for a prolonged period, you would 
you, I don't think you'd struggle, but you'd have to think about it a little bit more. I could literally just held it like that and it would have filled <laughs> within three seconds. Like there was enough water. Um, I never had to plan where I was gonna get water. It, it was around every corner. Um, and I, I always pretty much camped quite near water. Or if I wasn't right next to the water, then I would just get it just before. Um, because you don't wanna be having to traipse back out of your tent not if you do it in August because of the midges. Uh, I'll come on to that. Um, so yeah, my water well bottle with the filter. I also took the straw, which is in there now, because I took some rehydration tablet things, uh, like electrolyte tablets. So I filtered water with my other filtration device, poured it into there, and then put a rehydration tablet in there if I wanted, because I obviously didn't want to drink that through the filter. So with this, when you put the filter on, you just literally scoop the water from the water source and then drink it through the top, and it comes through the filter. So um, I'm an affiliate of Waterwell, the company, so if you do want to pick up one of these, please use my link, which is in the description. Um, it doesn't get you any discount, unfortunately, but it does make me a tiny little cut. So I appreciate it if you do want one. Um, then please use my link. Um, so yeah, there was that, the Camelback, and then my other filtration device. So the reason I had two filtration devices is because A, I don't ever trust one one. <laughs> Water's quite important, so you know. And two, because I, I want a bag one for filtering the water for using for like cooking and stuff. And it was actually really handy to have the two things. So this is what I filtered water to put into the Camelback for. And then that one was obviously just separate. And it, I, I would fill up the Camelback. But then if I just really wanted to be quick and just get a bit more water, then I would just use this. And also, I tend to drink and drink and drink from the Camelback and then not realise when it's about to run out. And then if I'm not near any water, then it's a pain in the butt. Whereas if I had this filled as well then that would run out without me realizing it was gonna run out and then I still had that. Does that make sense? I feel like I'm just rambling. Anyway, this is the platypus um, something or other. I don't know, the platypus filter anyway, comes with this bag which you fill up from the dirty water and then that attaches onto there and then, it's full of water. <laughs> And then you just basically you just squeeze. This was great. I brought this literally before the trail and um, it was awesome Would definitely recommend and use again both of those and obviously the camelback my knife Always take this just in case there's any weird people Um also uh, I cut off <laughs> I cut off the top of a Lucas aid bottle which I bought in Fort William because basically <sighs> the midges <laughs> If you go in August, right, the midges are horrendous. It is their worst time of year. Once you're inside that tent, you ain't coming back out, right? So if you need a pee, you're peeing in that tent. <laughs> so I cut the top off a um, Lucas Aid bottle using that. So I did use it, didn't stab anyone, not this time. Um, my head torch, it's the Petzl Arctic, had it ages, it's fine. Uh, Aquapack phone case, did actually use this. Um, don't normally put my phone in anything because like iPhones are meant to be waterproof these days and I just don't bother because I like to live on the wild side but I did actually use that because it, it was very wet. <laughs> um, gloves, didn't actually use these, can't find the other one but hey. Uh, Montaigne gloves, didn't actually use them, took them because I have Raynards and even in August my hands can just like touch a rock and be like whoa I'm gonna die. So um, took them, didn't use them, probably would take again because my hands are unpredictable. Uh, sponges. These are a hazy outdoor special. So Hayes Outdoors, I watched his video before I went. He used these like spongy things um, as his like towel and like to wash himself and stuff. I don't know if he used them to wash himself actually, but he used it as a towel. So I think he only took like two, but I took like four. They were really handy for like wiping down the tent in the morning if it was wet, wiping three million midges off the tent in the morning. Oh, well, a half ass job anyway, because you couldn't get them all off. Um, but yeah, washing and drying myself um, in the rivers, used them. Um, what else did I use them for? Just loads of stuff, really handy. Didn't take a towel, just used these. Put like four of them spread throughout my bag. Definitely recommend those, would use again. Oh, the midge net, literally <laughs> the life-saving piece of equipment. So this is like a full jumper one. 
And I got it on a website, which I think is literally called something like midgenetjumpers.com or something like that. Anyway, Google midgenet jumper if you want one. Um, so good. Like, better than just having the head net because, like, if you got a t-shirt on and stuff, they couldn't get your arms. Comes with, the, like, little mittens as well, but I didn't wear them that much because you can't really do anything. Like, you get them stuck in the tent, zip and stuff. Um, so I sacrifice my hands most of the time. But, yeah, amazing. Definitely, if you're going to Scotland in August, get yourself one of these. I'm not even joking. It's so good. Or at least a head net. You need something. Trust me. My tent, the MSR Hubber NX one person tent. So I kept like the internal bit on the inside of my bag, pegs and poles on the outside, and then the outer fly sheet fly sheet whatever it's called the outer sheet of the tent i kept mostly in the front this is a great tent um really lightweight uh love it would use again i never ever feel the need to have a two-person tent like a lot of people will have a two-person tent even when there's only one of them i've never in life ever needed that but there were a couple of occasions on the cape wrath trail where i was like mm, a two-person would be handy right now and the only reason that is is because of the midges because like i said once you're in your tent you're literally not like you can't even open the zip a bit because they're going to come in so you almost wanted to have everything like in the actual compartment with you so that in the morning when you're packing up you could pack up like in that compartment and then only get out once you've got the midge net on obviously and you're all smidged up to take the tent down and pack that away um so and that was really difficult in a one man so yeah that's the only time i thought about having a two but i managed fine with a one and i wouldn't buy a two just for that oh these gators <laughs> gatorades they're not called gatorades they're called gators so um these are really good like i i haven't used these before I bought a cheap pair, relatively cheap pair, Trek Mates, um, just a go outdoors special. Would definitely use again, like really good. Like they just stop stuff getting in your boots. They stop like the back of your leg getting like wet. When you go in a bog, I mean, obviously you do still get wet, but like they just help a bit. Um, and they're just like a nice little warm hug for your lower leg. Like I actually really enjoyed wearing them. I can't really like into that then, didn't I? Anyway, yeah, gaiters, love them definitely would use again um okay so my stove is in here so i just use the um msr pocket rocket i've got a lighter in there i think i took about four lighters because every bag i went into i found another lighter i just have this paranoia because i've had lighters break on me before that like i've got all the food i've got all the water i've got the stove and i get somewhere and i've got nothing to light any of it with like it renders the whole thing useless if you haven't got any fire so anyway that was a long story. Um, I've got like the OEX, OEX like one person pan set thing. This was the big gas. Yeah, the MSR. Um, always put a cloth of some sort. It's one of them sponges in there because I can't cope with all rattling about when you're walking. So obviously, yeah, obviously take that again. And then the thermos pot is definitely a contentious one. I love this pot. It's got my spoon on the top. So this was the only spoon that I took, this fold up spoon. But I definitely didn't need to take this pot. But would I take it again? I didn't really think about it because I always take it. So even when I was like stressfully lobbing food out of my bag just before I left because it was too heavy and I didn't have enough space, my brain did not go throw out the thermos, <laughs> which seems a bit ridiculous right now. But the thing is, right, <laughs> Here we go, here comes the excuses. Mm -hmm. So in the morning, I wanna have a coffee and I wanna have a porridge. I sound like a right princess now, don't I? But the thing is, you can tip your porridge sachets into there, you boil up one pot of water, you pop the water in and you put the lid on and that just does its little thing. And then you can have your coffee in the saucepan side here. So make my coffee there. And then within a few minutes, this is all ready to go. And you don't have to put your porridge in there. But that's not really necessary, is it? <laughs> so let me just think about the logistics of this for a sec. So imagine I didn't have that, right? So I boil the water like this. Okay, water's in there. Coffee bag is in there. So we pour water in there. So we've only got this left then with water already in it. So we have to tip the porridge sachet into the already boiled water. Don't know how I feel about that. Mix it. And then you need something to cover it. Otherwise, it's not going to... Ah, oh, I could do that. <sighs> 
kind of works, to be honest. It's not a full seal, but my porridge would probably be okay like that. Okay, turns out I was being a slight pleb. If I actually put the handle up, it fits perfectly that way up on there. I suppose you could stick the heat back on. You could put it back on the stove and boil it and stir. Okay, it fucking works. Fine, fine, we don't need the thermos. Probably just broke it anyway. <laughs> So I didn't send myself a food resupply parcel, which I know a lot of people do, so that they don't have to carry as much from the beginning. I think they usually send it to Kinloch U Post Office, which is the village shop as well. I didn't do that, mainly because I'm not organised enough to get that sorted beforehand. So what I did was I carried enough evening meals to cover me for the entire trail, enough breakfasts, or so I thought, but actually I changed that, but we'll come on to that in a sec, for the entire uh, trail. So the only thing I intended to resupply on the trail was the snacks that I was eating throughout the day. And what I did was I wrote myself a list in the front of the guidebook, which I took with me. <laughs> Ultralight packer over here took the guidebook. Um, and I also marked it on the maps, because I had the maps as well, obviously. The places where I would hopefully be able to resupply food. And I'm going to go through them, because some of them did not come into fruition. And I also wrote myself a list of places where I hoped I could stop for an evening meal because I did plan to stop and have a few pub meals on the way as well. And I can tell you something, I'm so glad I did because I hiked so much better the day after a pub meal. So I do recommend stopping for food en route if you can. So my evening meals were the fire pot food meals. I absolutely love these. Fire pot food, cook the food and then dehydrate it. So it's proper meals. It's not like processed, horrible stuff. It's really good. And they do it in this compostable packaging, which I love because it's plastic free. So I don't feel as guilty about it. The only difference is you don't cook it in the bag. You cook it in your pot, which is fine. So I took 15 of those with me and I was aiming to complete the trail within around 16 to 18 days. I ended up doing it in 17 days and I did actually have meals left at the end. So I'll tell you in a second where I stopped for food. I took porridge sachets for breakfast and I think I took 20 of these because I was thinking one a day, plus if I got really hungry in the day, then I could knock up a porridge on the trail. However, from the first day, I decided that I needed two every morning. <laughs> But I decided that was fine because I knew that at least at Ullapool I would be able to get more porridge sachets. So yeah, I had two of those every day plus a little peanut butter sachet. And this was one of the things that got sacrificed when I was stress packing last minute. So I didn't take enough to have one of these every day. So I was short the last few days, which was horrible because I absolutely love peanut butter. But hey, there are worse things in life than not having peanut butter with your breakfast. I mean, not much worse things in life, but a little bit worse. I took enough coffee to cover me on the whole trail. So I used these Percol coffee bags. I wasn't gonna faff about with a coffee maker or any of that stuff. I mean, I was packing heavy enough as it was. I wasn't gonna take off AeroPress as well, but these are great. They're completely plastic free. Percol is the coffee brand that I usually drink. So yeah, I took tea bags, plastic free ones. Can't remember the name of the brand for some reason, but they're in a green box and I use them like every day of my life. I'm not sure why I can't remember that. And then there's my snacks, which I was eating throughout the day, which, I can't remember exactly how much I started the trail with, but it was enough, I hoped, to get me to the first point where I thought I could buy more. So it obviously depends what route you take, because there's a lot of route variations on the Cape Wrath Trail, but for me, these were the places I had written down. I'm just gonna stop myself there because I really waffled this. So, in order of appearance on the trail, Numero uno, the cafe at the Glenfinnan Visitor Centre. If you're lucky enough, you'll see the Harry Potter train whilst you're eating a burger. Please note it is a visitor centre, so probably shuts about five o'clock. Creve die. There's a B&B &B and tea rooms at the head of Loch Horn. When I got there, it was shut. Shattering my dreams of pie and chips. I've heard it's not very reliable, so don't rely on it. Numero un de toi. Toi. Shield Bridge was meant to be my first resupply point. There's a shop on Google Maps that I can assure you is not a shop. And the guidebook tells you there's a petrol station on the north side of the loch, which is probably fine if it's not a Sunday and in Covid times. It was shut. However, I got an amazing evening meal in the Kintail Lodge Hotel. Bear in mind, I think they didn't start serving till about five. And I also stayed in the Shieldbridge campsite that night for my first shower. No more fear. Sounds like no more fear. Number four in German. Strathcaran is another tiny place with a post office that opens for about an hour a week and looks like something from Cabin Fever, so obviously that was shut when I got there. So I raided the chocolate bar selection in the Strathcaran Hotel and waited two hours until they started serving food after 6pm. Worth it. Numero cinque. 
apparently that's Italian. Kinlo Q is the first place where I got to do a proper resupply. The service station does really good food. I was there by four in the afternoon, but according to a quick Google search, it shuts at half past six and is not open on a Sunday, so watch out for those Sundays. I'm pretty sure the cafe shut earlier as well. You've also got the village shop and post office, which is where I said people send their resupply parcels to, and the hotel, which does food after 6pm and you need to book. It's busy. There's also a campsite there which I didn't stay in, but I met a couple of people who did and I don't think they booked. Nom your shist. <laughs> Apparently that's Russian. Anyway, Ullapool is your biggest and most reliable place to resupply and get food. That's if you choose to divert to it. It's like a 12 kilometre diversion off the trail, which I did choose to do. By definition, it's a village, but it's like a typical small town. You've got a big Tesco's there, which is great for resupply, a boots, an outdoor shop, Loads of places to get food and a campsite, which I did stay on. Norma Zeva, that was Dutch, odd. Oikel Bridge has a hotel which apparently you can get food at. I can tell you nothing about it, unfortunately, because I didn't stop there. Sorry, she's so awesome. Sounds like she's so awesome. That was Slovak. They know, see? They know. This is the London stores near Kinloch Burvey. I didn't actually need anything, but it's kind of a rite of passage for Cape Brass trailers to stop here. Very interesting shop. Pretty cool. If you wanted a proper meal, you could divert to Kinloch Burvey. I didn't do that. I wanted to push on and get to Sandwood Bay for my last night of camping and have time to get naked and run in the sea, as you do. <laughs> right, this is my power supply. This is way more than you would need if you were not going to film the entire trip. <laughs> these are the Power Gorilla. They're from a company called Power Traveller. So these are flipping expensive. These are like 100 quid each. <laughs> Um, but they're pretty meaty. I think they do about 10 phone charges each. I'll, I'll put on the screen what capacity they are. But yeah, I took two of those because obviously I was charging my phone and also mainly for the GoPro battery so that I can actually film it. So you would not need this much power as a normal human. Two of those, man, that is a lot. And also, <laughs> Oh, this is a funny one. So this is the Power Traveller uh, solar panel, which works with these power gorilla things i did not use this <laughs> so in the weight that i'm going to do after which you could take if you take out all the stuff that i took that you don't need i'm going to take all of this out and i'm just going to replace it with the weight of like one of those rav power like twenty thousand milliamp hours or whatever it is and for recharging right so the bothies are amazing and some of the estate ones, so not the Mountain Bothy Association run ones, but some of the actual estate bothies have power in them. Twice I managed to charge my phone in a bothy. The one at Glenfinnan, uh, just after the viaduct, viaduct has power supply in it. One of the sockets doesn't work, the other one does at this current time. So the Barrasdale one is another uh, private estate bothy. They asked for like a honesty box donation of five pound in there, but it's got water, it's got a toilet and it's got power. So I charged my phone in there. So I had two phone charges without having to use these. And, but yeah, when I got to Ullapool, I stayed on a campsite, on the Ullapool campsite. And although they don't officially have places for you to charge stuff, what I did was once I felt like most people had gone to bed on the campsite, because it's quite a busy campsite, it's not the type of place you want to be leaving stuff around, especially when these battery packs are worth £100. Um, but I did. I snuck into the laundry room, which, by the way, I washed my clothes. <laughs> so I was like 10 days in, I think, at that point, when I got to Ullapool. I literally washed my clothes. But yeah, I snuck into the laundry and behind the washing machines, I didn't unplug anything. <laughs> I didn't unplug any washing machines. But there was plugs that weren't in use. So I hid one of these plugged in behind the washing machine and just really hoped for the best. Fully kind of accepting that if it got robbed, it was my own fault. And then I set an alarm for 4 a.m. so I could go back in and swap them over because obviously I only had the one lead. So I managed to get complete fully charged on both of these when I was in Ullapool. And I knew that would see me through to the end then. Um, so yeah, if you do go to Ullapool and you go to the Ullapool campsite, it's at your own risk, but you can hide stuff in the laundry room. <laughs> right, clothing. Um, there's definitely a couple of things I would take out of here, but not a lot. Um, right, stop. Oh my god, <laughs> look at that face. What the actual... Anyway, twice I filmed this bit about clothing, right? And I waffled so much both times that this video would be like four hours long. This has been such a lesson in how to do a kit video, if nothing else. So here's what I wore on the trail. Here's some labels so you know what they all are. 
You can pause the video now if you want to have a look at what each thing is. And then here's the relevant and useful bits of waffle. Hat. This isn't the hat I started the Cape Wrath Trail with. <laughs> I lost my hat um, on on like a few days in. I was absolutely fuming. But um, so I was hatless for like quite a few days. Anyway, I bought this hat in Liverpool, <laughs> and I really like it. Um, I think Hayes Outdoors actually had this on his video and that wasn't a conscious thing like I didn't go in there and go oh Hayes Outdoors had this but this one is so light and like so foldable and so dryable and it was really comfortable as well it's just like really soft on your head that I was like nah mate I'm definitely getting that so it looks like I am a Hayes Outdoors carbon copy with this but actually his was green um but no yeah good good hat like that and then these leggings, oh my god, these are amazing. Fjallraven, can you even see me? I, I don't know, I can't tell. Um, Fjallraven, uh, Abisko trekking tights, I think they are. I bought these literally like the week before I went because usually when I go hiking, I just, I don't wear actual hiking leggings. I just wear like my 2XU um, like gym type leggings. That is going to change because these are amazing. They're not cheap, but... I tell you what, they're flipping worth it. They're amazing. Um, so they have like these kind of bits on the knees so that you, you know, obviously you don't rack them. Same on the butt. Um, and the main thing with them is they just dry so quickly. So like they're warm enough. Um, they're really comfortable. They've got pockets. So my phone goes in that side and then there's a little zippy one there and there's one on the inside. I keep, I'm jumping all over the place here, aren't I? Anyway, the main thing is they dry so quickly, um, which my like gym type leggings just would not have dried like these did. This was the only pair of leggings I took, um, apart from just what I wore in a tent, which I'll come on to in a second. Um, but yeah, so when they got wet, they needed to dry. Um, they were occasionally still a bit wet the next day, but just nothing like what my gym leggings would have been. And also, they don't hold smells like my gym leggings would. Like, my gym leggings feel like they're so tight and, like, up and about you <laughs> that they, like, you know, you ain't showering that much. Like, you do smell, all right? <laughs> like, you smell. But these just don't seem to hold the smell. Um, So I did. These are amazing these are amazing and i absolutely love them um and if i can afford it i'm gonna buy another pair <laughs> not yet boots these are my absolute favorite things in the world <laughs> but what i would say about footwear it's quite a bone of contention some people go for trail shoes some people go for boots the thing is your feet are going to get wet anyway so on the cape raft trail i don't care if you're wearing thigh high waders you're still gonna get wet feet. Well, maybe if you wore those, you might be okay, but that wouldn't be the comfiest. So the number one thing you need to think about when you're thinking about your footwear is, are you gonna be okay in them when they're wet? And the thing with these bad boys is they were absolutely as comfy, maybe even more comfy when they were wet as what they are when they're dry. Because these are a minimalist footwear, they don't have like a really thick foam inside them like normal boots. So they don't soak up any water, so they don't feel minging as soon as they're wet. They don't get any heavier because they're not holding on to the water. They're super lightweight. The grip is amazing. They're brilliant for crossing rivers and any kind of rock work because your foot can actually curve on the rock rather than just being like a platform on top of it. Your feet can move. <laughs> And yeah, I could honestly go on like all day about these boots because I absolutely love them. Yeah, wouldn't have chose anything else. But like I said, when you're choosing footwear for it, just think about how you're going to feel when they're wet. Next up, this is what I packed. Again, you can pause it if you want to read all of the labels. And here's what I wouldn't take if I did it again at the same time of year. I ditched the mid layer because I didn't need it. It wasn't cold enough. I ditched one of the pairs of underwear because I didn't need two spare pairs. If I wanted to get really lightweight, I could ditch the spare t-shirt and just live in the one. To be honest, I could ditch the spare sports bra as well. Oh, cold, wet, stinky sports bras. Anyway, yep, ditch that as well. Jesus, there's nothing left. But then, that is how you be lightweight. And I could have done it without these things, easily. Right, I know what you're thinking. Sarah, why are you not ditching that thin base layer top? I have a rule that I always keep one full set of base layers for tent and tent use only. That means they can never come out in the day. So if I'm ditching the mid layer, I don't have any other long sleeve options for in the day apart from my Gore-Tex jacket. 
So I'm keeping that thin base layer in. Don't judge me. And speaking of smells, obviously my pants were on the front line. <laughs> And I got these new pants, right? They're called Booty. Absolutely hate the name, but loved the pants. I loved them for similar reasons to the leggings. They dry a lot quicker than cotton does and they just seem to stay cleaner. And even if you want to just dip the under under cracker, how do I how do I <laughs> how do I explain this? If the under bit, <laughs> if you want to dip that in a river and just give it a little bit of a rub, preferably not upstream of like someone filling their water bottle down the bottom. But if you want to do that, just to give them a little fresh nip, they dry out quite well by the next day. Obviously, they're still a little bit damp, but like, I don't mind wearing damp. <laughs> I don't mind wearing damp pants, <laughs> apparently. Um, but compared to, you know, like damp, damp cotton, this type of material is just like, yeah. It's kind of like when you have to put wet bikini bottoms on, like it's not as bad as putting wet pants on. Do you know what I mean? This is my waterproof jacket. It's a Gore-Tex Rab jacket. Um, some people use like, more like trail running type jackets for this to be ultra lightweight clearly i'm not ultra lightweight so didn't um love this jacket i've had it for like i don't know a couple of years now i think the reason i love it so much is because it has a massive hood <laughs> it's actually helmet compatible but my head is helmet sized <laughs> so i love this because you can get like fully encased in it and like have my cap on as well so that like no water gets in my face um yeah this is awesome i'm so rambly right now it's unreal <laughs> okay my rab down jacket it's like the rab electron or whatever i've had it for years it's absolutely battered it's got tape all over it um but it's fine and um, i still use it so it's great and yeah if down gets wet it's gonna stay wet but i just didn't let it get wet this was just for in my tent at night like this didn't come out in the day i knew i wasn't gonna need it in the day i'd got other stuff plus it was like warm enough anyway so this was literally just for in the tent if i needed it okay socks so I obviously had the Bridgedale ones that I've got on and then I had another pair of Bridgedale ones, exact same pair. So both of those were for hiking and this pair were for hiking. And then my final pair was a tent slash emergency pair. I didn't massively need to wear these in the tent to be honest because I wanted to air my feet. I didn't really want to enclose them in anything if I could help it. But if I was cold, I would have. I did put them on a few times. Um, but they were mainly like emergency socks. I always feel like you need just one, one pair that are completely dry throughout so that if you were like getting towards the end and everything was like soaked and stinking and horrible and like just life was shit a dry pair of socks i just feel like could be a lifesaver so yeah emergency socks yeah so so three pairs of actual hiking for in the day that's excessive probably but i wouldn't change it because you can't dry stuff like if you want to give yourself any chance of having like less than 70 percent sop in socks <laughs> every day then you need three pairs um because i was hanging it, it looks ridiculous but i was hanging them on the outside of my pack and if it was pissing down i was having that them underneath the um cover thing i feel like there's midges here have they bloody followed me from scotland have they just come out of something they've just come out of my bag we don't have midges in wales what the hell's going on <laughs> you don't need to come and be in the video just because i'm talking about scotland <laughs> Oh Jesus, I'm going to have to go soon. Anyway, um, so yeah, it's two pairs of Bridgedale ones and then these, which I bought just before I went. They're the 1,000 mile ones and they're supposed to be like um, guaranteed blister free. And obviously I didn't get blisters, but it's not down to these socks at all. They're like the double layer ones, which I just find kind of weird. Um, I wouldn't take these again. They were worse at drying out just because the two layers, I think. And they kind of look weird. They look like, like, look at them. They look like some kind of weird granny like stocking. So when I hung them on the outside of my bag, they just look weird. Anyway, it's not really that important, but <laughs> I, no, I wouldn't take them again. I'd just take another pair of these ones, to be honest. So I would take three pairs of day hiking socks again. Shoot me, but I would. Oh, I also took these, um, Vibram Five Fingers, had them for absolute years. These are what I used to wear before the days of the Vivo Barefoots. Stop wearing these really because you can't just wear these in life because they look a bit weird. Um, but I took these really for the river crossings. I only used them once for river crossings because other than that, I just kept my boots on. Um, so, because your feet are wet anyway, so what's the point? 
Um, but they were handy like when I was in Ullapool and stuff because I went, you know, I left the campsite and went to the chip shop and the big Tesco's and stuff. So they were handy for that. But like, were they necessary? Not really. Like you could just wear your boots. And to be honest, I was thinking of like when I came home, but I ended up coming home in my boots because um, I managed to dry them out a bit like when I finished. So I'm going to put them on like the don't need them pile. Um, poo shovel, we need that because you know, people don't want to be stepping in your turd. So for my navigation, I had a combination of the paper maps, which are the Harvey maps specifically made for the Cape Wrath Trail so that you only need two. So I actually looked into how many of the um, OS maps that I would need, you know, the ones 25,000 ones. I counted them on Amazon and it was something like 14 maps or something. I was like, I'm not carrying 14 maps. <laughs> so I got the Harvey ones, you only need two. They literally just show like the little sections that you need of the maps, because obviously you're going like that. You don't need like that for just that bit. Does that make sense? <laughs> That made sense to me. But yeah, these are really good. They're one to 40,000 um, and they are waterproof. I took a map case as well and I don't really know why. I wouldn't take that again, I don't think. And before I went, I also marked all of the potential food stops and the potential restock points on these. And also what I marked on here was a few camping spots. So some I'd seen on other people's YouTube videos and some were from the guidebook as well. So just ha so I could have a rough idea of where I might want to aim to camp. But it's not something that I planned out at all. I kind of don't think you can well maybe you can I'm just not that type of person I'm not going to plan exactly what I'm going to do every day because it'll never work out I just don't have that much foresight <laughs> and then I had my phone also as my GPS and I use the OS Maps app and I've got to be honest I absolutely love it I think it's brilliant the guidebook will constantly say like oh this bit would be really hard to navigate if you know the weather came in or this bit's really hard to navigate blah 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 and I know relying on an electrical device is never the right thing to do, hence why I had the maps, I had my compass, I could take bearings if I needed to, but I did not need to. Like, my phone was fine, I had plenty of power, I used the, the maps app a lot because it's just quicker and you don't want to be fannying around, but obviously you need the skills and the maps as the backup. And there were certain days where I just used the maps, but for the, like, the hard navigation, I was just using the OS maps app. I'll be fully honest with you. And I'm not someone that's like, oh, you know, quite old school, you should never use apps because you just gotta move with the times. As long as you're sensible and you know you've got other options and skills to deal with it if your phone dies or you lose it or whatever, then there's nothing wrong with it. It's just another tool in the toolbox. If you're a plumber, like, would you not bother having a spanner just because like it might break? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> That was a shit analogy, on it? But yeah, I just, it's a tool and I think they're amazing and why not? As long as you've got the other skills and the other things, then go for it. So yeah, I, I used everything. <laughs> why not? Pads because I have a uterus. I've started using period pants now in normal life, but because I'm not far into the journey with those, I wasn't prepared to take them because of the whole like trying to wash them and stuff. So I did take disposable pads. Took a comb. Um, this is the toilet roll, the like ones that don't have the center. They sell them to you as like camping toilet roll, but I swear to God, you could just pull the center out of a normal toilet roll. So I don't know why I bought that. Um, and I ended up with some left because <laughs> we're gonna get personal again. But in the beginning, I was keeping this in the side of my bag. So every time I was having a pee, I was using this because I didn't want to make the pants smell of piss too quickly. Um, but yeah, I, I gave up on that. After, like maybe about halfway through, I was just like, screw it so i ended up not really using that much of the toilet roll because when i was having a poo i just using the wipes too much don't care um <laughs> just what you're here for right <laughs> bamboo toothbrush again i'm not one of these ultra light people so i don't cut it in half i ain't got time for that in my life um and then i've got things like oh i've got toothpaste like normal mini toothpaste um hair bubbles like um lip lip stuff after bite i use that there's another lighter in there like i said i'm a little bit paranoid about it eye drops and then right little mirror i'm rustling the bags that's probably really annoying small mirror um which i took because of like checking for ticks and stuff i probably wouldn't take i don't know if i'd take that again because i just use my phone ah stuff is definitely biting me <laughs> god they've come with me how am I going to do I, I need to finish this tonight, but I'm going... Wait, just put the smidge on. <laughs> oh, 
Oh my god, why am I so idiot? I'm such an idiot. Put the smidge on and they won't get you. Took a pocket hand wash, didn't use it. Took a pocket body wash, I did use that because I had two showers, once at Shieldbridge and once at Ullapool. So I did use the pocket body wash um, leaves. They're like super light. Um, so they are worth taking. Fabric wash leaves, because I was thinking if I needed to swill anything in the campsites. I didn't need them um, because when I actually washed stuff at Ullapool, um, they had a machine that you could get washing powder from, so I wouldn't bother with those again. Oh, and I had shampoo ones, which I've used all of. Basically, they're kind of crap because you need to use basically like a third of the pack to actually wash your hair, but that was fine because I washed it once at Shieldbridge, once at Ullapool, and then once after I'd finished at Durness, so it was fine. I actually don't have a first aid kit, never carry a first aid kit for anything. So I bought this tiny little ultralight, watertight medical kit. It was off like ultralightgear.com or co.uk, something like that. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a token gesture, to be honest. Like, <sighs> It's got like plasters and like tape and like some bandages and you know those kind of general like first aidy bits that if you had like a cut or something um, <clears throat> would stop infection. I don't know why my voice is going. Oh yeah, wait, because I've talked for ages. I'm, I hope this isn't. This is getting a bit long, isn't it? I'm sorry. Hopefully it's useful though. Um, <coughs> if you're doing the trail, then I'm hoping that this is useful. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a token gesture, but obviously I felt like I should have something, especially because I was on my own. But like, if you're having a heart attack, there's no defib in there, do you know what I mean? Or if you break your leg, what the hell's that going to do? But you should take something. Didn't use any of it. <laughs> oh, tick, tick, tick things. Definitely used the tick things. I actually only had three ticks, which I don't think is that bad. Ticks generally don't like me. I've never had ticks literally until this hike. Um, I had two on my arm and one under the strap on my sports bra. Um, so yeah, definitely the tick things, you need those. Um, oh, these, right, these, I didn't need these. <laughs> I did not need these. So I got really paranoid about the whole blister thing. And like literally about two days before I left, I bought these weird like gel things. Like I feel like my head could go in there. God, this is kind of weird. This is getting weird. This is ow. It's stuck. Oh God, what have I done? Just uh, let's move on. Foot care is massive. This is like the number one thing I was worried about and it's something that I've like practiced for years I've done quite a few like long distance hikes never anything this long so that's why I was quite paranoid about it but it meant that I really really focused on it and I literally treated my feet like they were made from glass like if anything was gonna probably stop me getting to Cape Wrath, it was my feet falling apart so I just knew that from the start I had to be so on it with the foot care and as a result, I actually came back from the trail with not a single blister. Whoa, rewind. Should we just say that again? I came back from the Cape Raft Trail without a single blister. Whoop, <laughs> is that even a thing? And it's not because I'm lucky or never get blisters. In fact, I'm really blister prone. My heels are like the knobbliest things you've ever seen. Like I swear there's some kind of bone deformity there these days or like heel bunions or something. Doctors let me know if that's a thing. Anyway, why am I talking about like my knobbly heels on the internet? Um, let's move on. <laughs> Like we kind of accept that when you're gonna go and do the Cape Wrath Trail, your feet are gonna fall apart and be annihilated. Let me tell you, it doesn't have to be that way. <laughs> So prevention is always better than cure. I've always taped up my heels because I know they're a blister prone area for me. I've always taped them on every long distance hike that I've done. But what I decided to do on this, because I was so worried about it, I actually used Compede from day one. So it wasn't cheap. <laughs> I had a lot of Compede with me, you know, the big kind of, well, the medium ones they're called. But I put Compede and blister tape on my heels every single day from day one. And I reckon that was a lifesaver because as soon as you get that tiny little bit of hot spot or bit of rub in, you're screwed, like it's just gonna progress. So the longer you can stop that happening or completely stop it happening, the better off you are. 
I kept washing my feet in cold water every single day at least once, preferably at the end of the day if I could before I was getting into the tent because then I could air my feet out and stuff. But it wasn't always possible because it depended where I was camping and if there was midges and blah, blah, blah. So quite often I did wash them in the day as well. And it's quite a nice way to have a break anyway, like stop at a nice river and have a foot wash. But again, it depends on the weather and stuff. But yeah, washing my feet in cold water every day was a big one drying them off completely and then using talcum powder and I can't express to you enough how good talcum powder is on stuff like this. It's not something I use in life but for trails I definitely do. I also put it on again in the morning before I go hiking just on my dry feet and I also sprinkle it into my socks and that's something I learned when I was in the officer training corps and it's a, it's a really good tip. As much as I could, I was trying to air my feet out. So at night, I wasn't putting socks on in the tent unless I really needed to. And then in the day as well, if I was stopping for a bit and it wasn't raining, I would take my shoes and socks off and just like air my feet out and dry my socks out as well. My boots obviously played a massive part as well. I would say about 40% of it was the fact that my boots are so comfy, but also how I treated my feet when I was putting my boots on and off. And you wouldn't think that would make that much difference, but trust me, it does. So fully unlacing my boots when I was gonna put them on, no cramming my heel in and scrunching my sock off. I would place my foot in as if it was made of like cotton wool push my heel towards the back of the boot and sit it in comfortably and then start lacing up tightly from the bottom. And then the same when I was taking my boots off, I didn't just yank them out. I unlaced the boots completely and then just lifted my foot out. And it is literally just treating them like they're the princesses because they were the things that were gonna get me to Cape Wrath, so. And then also using the poles, I think this made a massive difference because when I'm fatigued, obviously my gait pattern changes and also carrying a pack changes my gait pattern and I, I'm convinced that having the poles kept me more upright and by not leaning forward it was like maybe not putting as much pressure back on my heels I don't know I don't know what the science is but I just felt like having the poles kept my gait pattern and my posture more upright and just better and I'm convinced that helped me as well and also you're taking a little bit of the pressure off like your feet and stuff so the last thing I'm going to do before I finish the video, which I feel like has been really long, I'm sorry if it has, but if you are going to do the Cape Wrath Trail, I think this has been quite useful, says the person that made a video, but I don't know, let me know if it's been useful. The last thing I'm going to do is answer the final questions that I had on Instagram. So I've actually answered a lot of them already, but some that I haven't. So someone asked me about um, travel, like to and from the trail. So. Quite luckily for me, my brother lives in East Kilbride, which is just outside Glasgow. So I drove to there and left my van and then got trains up to Fort William. Started from there, obviously. And then when I finished, getting back from Cape Wrath is a little bit harder, <laughs> um, but it's not as bad as you think. By the way, if you've not already read this, I'm sure you have, but if you are gonna do it, you need to check the firing times of Cape Wrath because it's a live military range. So you need to make sure that they're not firing at that time. So you can check on the government website, just Google like Cape Wrath firing times or something. It's a .gov site. Um, and they can decide within like 48 hours notice that they're gonna start firing, but that's just a, like a risk you have to take when you get there. When you get to the fence, there's flags. Like if the flag is there, the red flag, don't go. Is it red? I think it's red, yeah. So there's mini buses that run from Cape Wrath Lighthouse down to the Kyle of Durness. It is a bit hit and miss, like you don't know what the times are gonna be, but because the last day is quite a short one, You'll probably be at Cape Wrath, depending on what time you leave um, Sandwood Bay. You'll be there by lunchtime or mid-morning or just after lunch or whatever. But the, they stop running those little mini buses probably like mid-afternoon. But to be honest, because I had the time, I kind of wish I hadn't got on that mini bus because when I got on it and saw how stunning some of the beaches and stuff are on the Cape itself, like from the drive i wish i hadn't got on it because you couldn't obviously walk off if you went to and i had the time so i should have just done that so that is a bit of a regret to be honest so if you do have the time maybe consider doing that but yeah it's a bit hit and miss with the minibuses like you just turn up and see if they're going to come and then you just have to see if there's space as well because obviously they're bringing people from like the Kyle of Durness and they those people need to go back so it's only if there's space and there was only just about space for me on the one that I got on and I had to sit in the front like with this like old guy talking to the bus driver about their like gallstones and stuff which was great but anyway <laughs>
yeah, like I said, I kind of wish I hadn't fitted on it because I'd have rather just got, like, I'd have rather carried on walking. There's an amazing bothy, apparently, on that north coast um, of Cape Brass, so I kind of wish I'd done that. I'm going to have to go back and do it. And then the little ferry which goes across the Carla Durness, I say ferry, that's quite loose, like it's a tiny little boat, um, but I think that's running as long as the minibuses are running. But if you couldn't get on that, you'd have to walk inland around the Kyle, um, which would be another mission, but... At the end of the day, like you've walked that far, like if you had to do it, you would do it. That's how I looked at it. If I had to do that, I would have just done it. I suppose it just depends on time. Anyway, and then from there, there's um, a bus called... Hang on a sec. I forgot to say that from the other side of the ferry, I walked to Durness and then stayed in the campsite for a night. The Far North bus, I think it is. I'll put the name on screen. But basically, they're not huge buses. They're kind of mini buses. Um, and they go to either uh, Leg, which is where I ended up going to, because it depends what day, or Inverness, so all the way down to Inverness to get the train. So I went to Leg and then got the train from Leg to Inverness and then Inverness down. But like I said, it depends what day and you need to ring and book. And I didn't know this. And you can't really do that until you get up there anyway, because you don't know what, like when you're going to get there. Um, so I camped on the Durness campsite after I finished and I rung from there. Someone asked, how did you cope with all the water? <laughs> it's Scotland, like you just accept it. Like accept it from the start. Like before you go, just imagine that it's gonna piss down for the entire time. And then any days when it doesn't, it's just a bonus. And to be honest, I was so happy to be there. Like it didn't, it just didn't wear thin, to be honest. Like maybe if it had hammered it down for the entire thing, yeah, it would have been annoying. I think what's the worst thing is if it's like loads of consecutive days pissing down, which is kind of what happened to me in Noidart, um, because you just can't dry anything then, which is a bit of a pain in the ass. But yeah, just accept that you're gonna get soaked and it's fine. Someone asked, did anything work against the midges? I think I've already gone over this, but yeah, the midge net is the, like, a physical barrier is the only thing that like fully works. And someone else said, how did you cope with the midges? Same as the rain, really. Like, I just expected it. I knew they were going to be bad. And because I'd watched um, someone else's video, Eddie Fitz, I watched his video and he did it in August, like a couple of years ago. I saw how bad the midges were for him. So I just had that in my head. So if you're going to do it in August as well, Watch my videos. <laughs> this is not a plug for my video. Well, it is a plug for my videos. Watch my videos, because then you'll just expect that, and then you'll just you'll just get on with it. Like, get off me! Where is the bag? Ah! Ah! How much fun did you have? Like, so much. <laughs> I absolutely loved it, and I'm not joking. Like, there was literally only one little period of time like one afternoon where I was like get me to the lighthouse but the rest of the time I did not want it to end which again you'll see in my videos especially at the end you'll see in them people asking for tips on reducing unnecessary weight uh -uh. <laughs> I am the wrong person to ask I'm going to tell you now actually what the reway is so I, currently in this moment in time I don't know what it is because I need to go home and do it but I'm going to put it on screen so this is the potential weight that my kit could have been had I not been videoing it so have like loads of battery packs and taken out all the things that I've said in this video that I don't think were necessary so this is the weight that it could have been hopefully it's quite a good number but I don't know someone's asked me about research and resources so literally just the guidebook which I read some of some of before I came um the maps just looking through the maps and knowing the route um, all the both. someone asked me about bothies as well, like ha were there many bothies on the way? Yeah, lots of bothies um, and they're all marked on those Cape Wrath maps, Cape Wrath ma that's hard to say, <laughs> on those maps. <laughs> I have already answered this but I'm going to read it anyway. If you wore boots and Berghuis Manta gaiters, do you think you would still get wet, not into trainers? Yes, <laughs> you'd still get wet, like I said earlier. Unless you're wearing like full waders, you're still going to get wet. So just choose something that you're going to be comfortable in. I cannot hammer that home enough. Choose footwear that you're going to be comfortable in when it's wet. Someone asked me how I look after my cat. <laughs> um, I've got two housemates. So if they're, we kind of share the like looking after the cat. Um, but otherwise I've got a cat sitter as well. And other than people asking me why I got naked at Sandwood Bay, that's pretty much it. And why did I get naked at Sandwood Bay? Because it was Sandwood Bay and it was like the last camp before Cape Wrath and I was buzzing and like, why not? <laughs> so on a naked note, rather than a poo note for a change, I'm gonna end the video. <laughs> Hopefully you've enjoyed this. Hopefully it's been useful. 
I'm going to drop a couple of links in the description. You're obviously in no way obliged to do this, but if you have enjoyed this video or find it useful and you want to say thank you in some way, I'm going to put a link to my fundraising page because the Cape Wrath Trail hike was actually part of a bigger challenge that I was doing across the whole of Scotland this summer. So I actually cycled, paddleboarded and hiked from the bottom of Scotland to the top and I was doing that for charity so I would love a little donation on the charity page if you can obviously no pressure with that whatsoever and also I've just set up a buymeacoffee.com or whatever it is account thing so if you want to drop me a little coffee that would be amazing as well but again no pressure mine is a black americano sipped delicately through a midge net <laughs> when I'm on the trail otherwise frothy oat milk um you didn't need to know any of that i'm gonna shut up now because i'm rambling thanks for watching bye <laughs> um we've got a plane going over right now like should i stop <laughs> okay let's let's stop I'll, I'll, be, I'll be back have an interlude go and get a cup of tea have a pee Mush, where's it going do you want to be in my video there's a plane and it's ruining my video <laughs> Why is there constant noise of planes? Like surely they're going somewhere, they're not just floating about above you. You fuck off. Just fuck off to Spain or whatever you're doing.